Okay. So everyone's full from lunch. Now we're going to talk about sex, and then you can go home to sleep. So that's like a pretty much a perfect day for any animal on planet Earth these days. Um, thank you so much for for coming after after lunch. Um, you can get settled, get relaxed, because we've got an hour to dive into the future of intimacy and technology, this nexus of sexuality and wellness and robotics and AI. What does it all mean? My name's Bryony Cole, and I'm the founder of Future of Sex. Um, and I've been studying this for three years, studying the intersection of sexuality and technology. And what I found out might surprise you. It's a $30 billion dollar industry. What won't surprise you is people don't often talk about it because it has to do with sex. And anything to do with sex is usually very taboo. So thanks, Dragonfly, for hosting me. And especially anything to do with female sexuality. But I think what we all know here today is that technology has changed. Every aspect of our life. It's changed the office. It's changed social occasions, but it's changed the way we fall in love, we date, and we mate. And as I was thinking about what I was going to say today, um, there's a lot of different examples I want to share with you. But something that's become more obvious in my work very recently, um, something I haven't even shared uh, anywhere else yet, is is sort of this insight that may seem really obvious to you, but as we go further into the future, becomes quite hor horrifying. And that is that technology today, innovations in technology, are behaving more like humans, and we humans are starting to behave more like technology. More robotic, more technical, even in the most intimate parts of our lives. So today we have end-of-life robots that provide comfort and care. They provide intimacy in the absence of any person, any relative or family member being there during your last moments. We have Gatebox, an Virtual assistant, very similar to Alexa or something that would control the temperature in your home, but Gatebox is different because she also shares emotional text messages throughout the day with you, like "I miss you," "Come home," almost behaving like a girlfriend. And then, of course, the most obvious when we're talking about the future of sex is sex robots, and this is the first sex-capable AI. Her name's Harmony AI. She has 12 different personality types: funny, shy, charming, cute, submissive. You can dial her up and down. You can change her personality according to your wants and needs. And you know what? Harmony will even recite you poetry. And then we have chatbots. Probably a little more accessible. Probably something you, you might use or you've used already. Chatbots using algorithms and AI to help us through the most human, intimate situations. We have chatbots like Mend that offer algorithms to help you get over your heartbreak. We have texting services where you can learn to sext. You learn to sext with a robot. Sex with a robot first before you do it with a human. Artificial intelligence. Is helping us become more intimate, more familiar with our human skills. Technology is behaving like humans, and what are we doing? Humans behaving a bit more like technology. I mean, think of how we use our phones today. There's something about being online, exchanging all these messages. Teenagers look at their their phones 84 times a day, and the interesting thing about this is it does make us more robotic, doesn't it? We all kind of sense that anyway. The lack of eye contact, the lack of physical proximity to a person, makes you do and say things you probably wouldn't do and say in person. And leads to many instances of revenge porn, of cyberbullying, which is rampant among young people today. This is an effect 
called the online disinhibition effect. That's the ugly side, but I mean, the, the everyday side is when something exciting happens to us, we tend to experience it through our phones, don't we? I can see some phones here anyway, but please do, do continue to take pictures and share. But we do, we experience these things through our phones. We're not there with the people around us. We're there through our phones. We're not even experiencing it through our own eyes. We're experiencing it through the act of posting it online. We're engaging with our feelings when we get likes and follows. In fact, those likes, those follows, those comments, they almost tell us what to feel instead of that internal barometer, that internal compass. What we feel is determined by the amount of likes, by the amount of follows that we have. And what we're more interested in is what is happening online than what is happening down the street, on our street. We turn to our phones instead of each other when something real is happening, when we're feeling something, when we want intimacy, when we feel fear, we turn to our phones instead of friendships, instead of families, and what I've noticed is instead of romantic relationships. What are we doing to our relationships? And it's us, I think, and that's the argument I'll be making today. It's not the technology. We are so quick to blame technology. But in fact, the best sex tech that I've seen over the last three years enhances our intimate lives, enhances our sense of intimacy with one another. So, let me introduce you to a few really great examples of sex tech. This one here, Teledildonics, remote-controlled sex toys. So essentially, you can access Wi-Fi or a Bluetooth connection, some privacy issues there, but you can be together with a long-distance lover. They could be in London, they could be in another part of Thailand, but it allows us to be intimate with one another. Now, does it increase the depth of intimacy? Arguably, is it a replacement? Definitely not. Another great example of technology enhancing our sexual lives is in biomedicine. And 3D bioprinting is set to completely revolutionize the medicine world. And your sexual health, if you're a cancer patient, perhaps you suffered some trauma, a penile transplant or a uterus transplant is now possible. The first successful penile transplant occurred in 2016 in the US um, for a cancer patient, and two successful uterus transplants have occurred in Sweden, one in the US not successful. But what we're seeing here is really the potential to solve issues in medicine and sexual medicine around organ donors. There's a, such a low supply of organ donors in the world. Could the 3D bioprint bioprinting help with that and reduce those lines. Now, they're great examples of a positive, but I think what we're feeling at this point is that we're somewhere in the middle ground. There's some very strange feeling that technology is taking over our lives at this very confusing point where technology feels like it's running away from us and perhaps we're at the last chance to address this as humans, to stop acting so robotically, so technically with our relationships, and remember what's important in humanity, what's important with intimacy, how technology can be used for that, and what we should shy away from with technology. Certainly, what's very true is that there is a new normal. The virtual side of intimacy has expanded our boundaries of what we really see as intimacy. We have emotional intimacy, those mental connections, those feelings that we feel with one another, and then we have the physical side of intimacy, the touch. Doesn't have to be sex, but quite often it is. That physical side of intimacy is also, as we saw with teledildonics, being enhanced by technology. But how much? What I'm going to dive into for the next... We've got a while. Uh, 50 minutes of the talk, probably not 50 minutes, is these layers of intimacy in our lives, this part of being human that is so core to us. And it comes with three layers. Intimacy of the self, to really know oneself. We have to know our bodies, right? What's going on in our bodies, in our minds, in our spirits? Intimacy with another that connection that you feel with someone else, and intimacy in a relationship to society and a community. These are the pillars of what it means to be human, to be connected. 
I'm going to take a slight divergence because I think this is really important that you understand the word sex tech before we get started. Um, sex tech being used everywhere in the media at the moment, the rise has, has grown, you've probably read all sorts of articles about sex tech and thought it's just about sex robots. But sex tech is really what I'm talking about when I'm talking about intimacy and tech together. Sex tech is this convergence of sexuality and technology together, called sex tech, a $30 billion industry. So when I talk about sex tech, what I want you to really think about is sexuality. Sex tech is more than sex. It's sexual education, sexual health, crime and violence reporting, medicine, gender identity, of course pleasure, all these components that make intimacy great. And then on the technology side, we're really quick to jump to sex tech being all about robotics, which is exciting and sexy. But sex tech is also the chatbots, it's also the dating apps you use, it's augmented reality, it's artificial intelligence, it's websites, and it's the most simplest tools that you, you can come across in terms of sex toys. Sex and tech is really this blending of sexuality and technology. And I think what's important to remember is a lot of the most interesting examples never see the light of day. They're never, shone, uh, they're never mentioned in the media because they're not as sexy as sex robots or VR porn. But I'm going to share some of those for you today to look at how they're infiltrating our intimate lives. And I'll take a glass, a sip of water. <laughs> okay, so the first pillar of intimacy is this relationship with ourselves. And I talked before about kind of the dark realization that we all know, right? We all know that we need to take a digital detox. We probably need to have some sort of sacred space in our home where we don't use the phones. Maybe you have a basket as you walk in the door that you put your phone in. You don't sleep with your phone. Something to get away from technology being the only way that you recognize yourself getting off Instagram. But what I want to share with you, because I feel like other than the fact I am a complete optimist when it comes to sex tech, I think sex tech is radically changing the way that women relate to their bodies and experience their bodies in a really positive way. And so this relationship with self and sex tech is really important. And in fact, whenever I share OMG Yes, wherever I am in the world, people write it down. So write it down, or you can find it. Uh, I'll put some resources on my website. But OMG Yes is one of those really great examples of sex tech and, or technology that's enhancing our relationship with ourselves, our relationship with our bodies. So what is OMG Yes? OMG Yes is an online platform. It uses touchscreen technology, if you have an iPad, to really understand how females bring themselves to orgasm. Now, What's cool about this is that the technology was developed off a study done in 2016. Mind you, to, to take that long to do a study on female orgasm is kind of atrocious. But the first of its kind, in 2016, 2,000 women from the ages of 18 to 95. And they asked them, how do you bring yourself to orgasm? How do you essentially touch yourself? How do you masturbate? And they looked at that data, 2,000 women, and they identified 12 common techniques that women regularly use. It was great, they've bundled it up into this app, it looks amazing, it's really slick, there's videos, the touch screen means you can practice it, or maybe your partner can, and you can learn something new. That's an amazing use of technology for sex education. But what I really love about this as well, and something that's so powerful about sex tech, is that they also created an entire language around these 12 different techniques. This language that doesn't exist. It didn't exist before. We only had these sort of grimy or pop culture words to describe female sexual pleasure, or maybe an anatomy lesson that you learnt in high school. But here we have edging, hinting, consistency, accent, accenting. It's it, sex tech is creating a whole new language for you to share with your partner, to talk about with your friends. This, to me, is one of the um, premium, no, prime examples of why sex tech is so important and why we don't need to shy away from every instance of technology. And in fact, when it's applied really well, it helps us understand our bodies. It helps us get in touch 
with ourselves, our relationship with ourselves, and it helps empower women around their sexuality. How fantastic is that? Woo! <laughs> I, th I think it is, you know, and what, what I find so amazing that I had no idea when I jumped into this industry three years ago from Microsoft, actually, and I was heavy on the tech. I was thinking, what is the technology being used? We must study the technology, but actually, it's the cultural conversation that's happening that is far more interesting and is buoying all of this technology. And you'll see it reflected in um, women's pleasure toys now. So there's a whole collective called womenofsextech.com that all design pleasure products for women. Makes sense, right? In any other area of technology, we have you know, the experts designing for themselves, but for some reason, sex tech has been so male-dominated up until the last dec decade or so. And so now we have this rise of women that are developing products for women that understand women's bodies, that are also going out to women and saying, how do you like it? How do you do it? Sad that it's revolutionary, but it's amazing. And, and what you'll see is reflected in the design, other than this conversation, is like the, de the design is not overtly sexual. It's something that wouldn't look out of place on, um, on your bedside table, I guess, or even in like a gift shop. You wouldn't really know what it is. So I think this is a really interesting hallmark of the new era of sex tech and the way females are leading the way in, in sort of helping other women understand their own bodies and understand their own pleasure. Now, if we extend that even further, I think one of the most interesting applications of how we'll understand our own bodies, how we'll have an intimate relationship with ourselves, is this idea of body swapping. And this is sort of being experimented with in labs at the moment. It's very early days, it can feel a bit clunky. But can you imagine being able to put on a VR headset, fitted with sensors, and look down and be a completely different gender. What would it feel like to be a man? What would it feel like to be trans? These sorts of applications in technology, in sex tech, these are the ones that are most interesting. These are the ones that we need to be looking at and going, how are we going to change our experience? How are we going to change our relationship with others? We can be in their bodies. But if we rewind back to the present day in terms of technology and our relationship with others, of course, there's the obvious things like dating apps that are changing the way we form relationships. We're going through different social circles. We're jumping over entirely different communities in order to, um, through dating apps and, and mixing different cultures thanks to dating apps. We're also increasing the, the rate of STDs in the process. Um, so there's definitely some work to be done there around sexual education and health that's not the fault of dating apps, but is a happenstance of where we are in this global world now. Other ways that we're looking to connect. Well, we subvert technology when we use FaceTime to, instead of just having a business call or a conference call, whatever Skype was intended for, right? It came out of Microsoft. Um, we now use it for things called background Skyping. Teenagers use background Skyping as when you flip open your laptop and you talk to your boyfriend or your girlfriend, but instead of really talking to them, you just sort of open the laptop and then you walk away. Maybe you're watching a movie. You might, you might be on Skype for four to five to six hours at a time, going about your day and having that portal into that other person's life. And we see this as like a connected form of intimacy. Now, the sex tech or the technology designed specifically for this, not the Skypes or the FaceTime, are mostly these haptic technologies that really are concerned about transmitting the sense of touch. That's the thing that we, we immediately associate with intimacy with partners, physical sense of touch. And so here we have connected pillows and connected heartbeats. You wear this um, wristband and you can trans transmit the sound of your heartbeat to your lover at night. Now, obviously, people are taking this further than heartbeats. As we've seen with teledildonics, also kissing. So this is the Kissinger. It was developed in Singapore. Hasn't taken off yet. <laughs> I wonder why. Um, 
But they've developed this further. I think we have another, yes, photo where you can um, put your iPhone, essentially in this iPhone dock, you have these lips that are fitted with um, so these silicon sensors, right, that can transmit the touch of your kiss to the other person that's holding the other Kissinger in real time, and these miniature sensors make miniature movements. So, it, yes, heartbeats, kisses, FaceTime windows, we're doing everything we can to transmit physical sense of touch. What I thought was interesting about this in terms of just this broad scope, if we talk about intimacy, the marketing for Kissinger on their website, they're not only marketing to couples, they're marketing for families. So there's a grandma receiving a kiss from her granddaughter, and they're also marketing towards fans. So celebrities being able to kiss their fans, or fans being able to kiss their celebrities, I think would more be the case. And we often find that the marketing with teledildonics, so those remote um, connected sex toys, it's marketed towards these long distance lovers, but what we actually see, the use case or who's buying them is actually webcam models, um, and there's a great market for that. So, are we really comfortable with, uh, with transmitting touch yet? I dare say we're not, but it's on the way. Another example, which again, <laughs> when I stress like technology being able to help us with intimacy and be, be helping us to be more human and to enjoy these human experiences. That's really where the sex tech is getting great. Um, so this is the O nut, and this is solving the issue around, I'm going to butcher this word, dyspareunia, if anyone else knows it. Um, but basically, it's a case for painful sex, which 75% of women suffer from painful sex. A young woman decided, well, this, wouldn't it be cool if we could just limit the depth of penetration and customise it? And she did. She raised money on Kickstarter. It's now a very successful product. Again, kind of like OMG, yes, what I like about this is it's solving, it's solving an issue. It's helping people understand their bodies more and with their partners. And also, it doesn't look sexual, right? Sex tech doesn't have to look sexual. So it's a really good example of that. What about relationships with... Not people, but technology. We all kind of feel married to our phones, but do you think we could actually marry technology? <laughs> Maybe. Um, yes, so here's a really interesting example. I actually just found this in the past couple of days. I don't know if anyone's watched Black Mirror before, um, but this is actually derivative of an episode of Black Mirror, but this exists. So you could download this in the App Store. This is Roman. Roman passed away. He died in a car crash a couple of years ago. And his best friend, who incidentally, she's a computer programmer, she specializes in artificial intelligence, she decided to collect up all his text messages he ever sent her, text messages he sent her friends, his friends, sorry, and text messages he sent his parents. And she created a bot, a memory of her best friend that actually answers through natural language processing, that answers texts just like he would. And you can talk to him too. You can hear all about what he's up to in heaven, so-called. So the question with these things is, uh, will this become popular? There's another one that didn't take off called Etern.me, Eternomy, that enabled you to keep living as a bot while you have passed away. And what purpose does this serve? Now, the woman that created this bot said it helped her with the grieving process. She was able to find a way to grieve her friend by still texting him. She texts him still every two to three days. Some people would say it delays the grieving process as well. His dad, not very happy about this, he doesn't say things that he would normally say. The uncomfortable truth that's suggested here is that many of our flesh and blood relationships now exist primarily as text, right? We have these entire relationships with people that exist in text, and it wouldn't be that much of a stretch to say in a couple of years' time, in fact, I think some people already do this, conduct relationships entirely virtually, entirely via text, right? You never actually meet that person. And, and in the case of intimacy, perhaps you go on a first date in a virtual world, 
in VR. There's already VR dating on Facebook. Um, you go see a movie, watch a shared experience in a virtual world. You have your first kiss via the Kissinger. Um, and probably have your last fight via text, or maybe you turn into a chatbot. Is it good? These are the sort of questions that I want you to ask as well. What are we using technology for? Are we getting better as humans at intimacy? Or are we outsourcing that? And is that such a bad thing? Because in the case of Ghostbot, now, most women, if they've been on a dating app, will know those annoying dudes that end up trying to meet you for a drink, and you're like, I already tried to cut this out, but he's just not leaving me alone, to the point where it gets aggressive, and you're like, I wish this guy would just not keep pestering me. I wish he would kind of go away. Well, now, you can get Ghostbot, and it will do the work for you. So Ghostbot, if you're like, this guy, Tom, I've had a gutful, I'm sick of him, he's, too, he's pressuring me too much. Outsource him to Ghostbot. Send his number to Ghostbot, Ghostbot will ghost him for you. Is this a good thing? Are we, are we outsourcing emotional labour to technology and is that okay? Are we then foregoing uncomfortable experiences because we don't want to? And what does that leave us with? At least you don't have to deal with aggressive texts ever again now that you know Ghostbot exists. Now we're going to dive a little deeper in this gnarly world of intimacy and technology that exists today that feels like a stretch for some, but it's really a grey area. Can you marry technology? Um, this is Gatebox, created in Japan, sold out within the first week. They've just re-released their, their next version of Gatebox. As I said before, if you think of um, Alexa or your home virtual assistant that controls the temperature in your house, it's like that, but she also talks to you. Um, I'm going to play the promo video because I think that will create more, more questions for you um, rather than me explain it, and I'll be back right after the video plays. Okay, who wants a gate box? <laughs> no one? Um, so there are 3,700 marriage certificates issued for gate box and Japanese men um, today. So yes, it's true, you can marry technology. Not legally, though. But the company will give you a certificate, and if you work for Gatebox, you get a $45 a month stipend to spend on Gatebox, and you get her birthday off. How's that for perks? <laughs> 
So will, will we fall in love with this technology? What does that mean? That's not sex, but that is definitely intimacy, isn't it? And to me, it just reeks of this crisis of loneliness that we're all in, all the companion technology does. I was going to play the video, um, which you can look up, of the end of life machine too. How lonely are we that we have no one to die with? It's everyone's biggest fear, right? And when we think about the, the growing number of <laughs> these sorts of, I would say, companion techs or chatbots, this sense of artificial intimacy that we're developing, why are we doing it? Is it because we're all so absorbed in our own lives, in our own phones, that we've forgotten how to look up and have a conversation with someone else? Are we just that disinterested in our partners that when we come home, we just can't be bothered with them? And yet Gatebox can. She's great. She knows if you're in a bad mood or not. So <laughs> this, this idea that that uh, we can't put up with humans' imperfections, maybe, or we're kind of sick of it, but that computers can't, that's only going to get stronger. And uh, the best thing about technology is it has no feelings of its own, so it'll always be there for you. So this is rather worrying. People may think that robotic companions are better than the real thing. And as I said before, it speaks to this loneliness. You know, all of us just want to be seen, we want to feel a real connection. How deep can a connection with a robot really feel? And is that enough to justify living just with technology? And there was this great example shared in the book, 21st, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. He was saying, well, what happens when you come home and your smartphone understands your mood and offers you a snack from the smart fridge before your husband does? And it's like, yeah, I can see that happening. And <laughs> I think that the only real answer here is that for every single dollar that we keep throwing towards artificial intelligence and technology and chatbots, should we not also be throwing dollars towards human skills like intimacy and understanding and empathy, developing our own consciousness, our own skills around intimacy? It's kind of the conclusion that I've come to and perhaps, perhaps technology can help us, but I think we need to think about technology as enhancing our experience rather than being better than anything, you know, rather than being a full replacement. Now, <laughs> promise myself not to end on a negative note, so I'm gonna, send, I'm gonna share some, again, amazing examples of, of this idea of where technology can really help us with intimacy, with our connection to community, with solving issues, global problems around sexuality. So, and what I like about these examples is they're all very local, so they're all specific to country, although sexual violence is a global problem, as we all know. In South Africa, they've developed the Rape Axe, which is a female condom fitted with barbs. Um, it's in prototype stage, but a woman, young woman, old woman, any person, woman with a vulva, any person with a vulva would be encouraged to wear this on a blind date or as when they go out to a party. When it uh, grips on, you can't, you can't remove it. You have to go to a hospital to remove it. So the Rape Axe was developed in the rape capital of the world where rape occurs once every 17 seconds. Great example of technology being used for something we don't think around sex tech, but sexual assault. In Japan, just last month, they released the anti-groping hand stamp, sells for about 20 US dollars, sold out immediately online, and really this is just a deterrent in, um, in a place where groping is a huge problem on the subway, so much so that they have gender-specific cars, two-thirds of uh, Japanese schoolgirls will report being groped on the subway. And so this, uh, you know, an interesting applications of technology. I don't know how much I'd want to reach out and gro um, stamp someone that just groped me. But um, when we think about this, these are the sorts of things I want you to start thinking about in terms of sex tech, in terms of technology, how this can be used to help humans become more human, more in touch with intimacy in their community. In Iran, we have Toranj, again, a, a, a statistic that's real two-thirds of women will experience domestic violence in their homes. Um, and this app is developed to help them uh, reach social and legal resources. 
and is done very discreetly, so it doesn't really look like an app until you turn it on. In the US, we have Callisto, which is an online reporting tool for on-campus. It's aimed to address college assault reporting. One of the biggest barriers to sexual assault reporting, especially for young people, is um, that they have to name themselves, so anon anonymity. This uses uh, a technology where you're anonymous, you report the perpetrator, and then it, it sees so many people have reported this perpetrator that links it up and puts it in touch with law enforcement. Similarly to Spotlight, which was backed by or developed by Demi Moore and Ashton Kutcher, which it addresses um, child sexual predators across the world. It uses big data from all different tech companies. It scrapes all sorts of different forums and identifies uh, pedophiles and child sexual assault and porn. And it's been really effective in the US. So these are the sorts of examples of sex tech and intimacy at a community, at a global level, that are really going to make some change in the future in a way that I, I feel is positive. Now, because we're at Dragonfly, what I want to end on is the fact that a lot of this innovation in this sexuality and technology field I alluded to before, who's behind it? What is the common denominator here? A lot of this is being developed by women. Now, in the wake of Me Too and Time's Up movements, we've certainly had this cultural conversation boy up, and behind it, this wave of sex tech entrepreneurs that are women. When I joined Women of Sex Tech, a community you can find online, at the time there were 30 women, that was three or four years ago, there's now 250 women globally. They're all developing different products and services for sex tech. And so I think there's a very hopeful future. I think there's one where we think about our use of technology and maybe spending more time with people in person. We know we need to put our phones down. We know we need to develop intimate skills. We know we need to develop children to have these true intimate skills and spend time in person and develop relationships that aren't entirely mediated through screens. But we also know that technology can help us, and technology, quite frankly, is not going away. And technology can help us in really interesting examples, issues of education, of health, of medicine, and of pleasure. So I'm going to leave it there. Go women, go sex tech, and if you have any questions, we can put the lights up a little bit, and I think we've got about 15 minutes for questions on any of the topics that I've covered. And thanks for coming. Can we put the lights up a little bit? Or does anyone have any questions? Um, do you believe that the... Thank you. Hi, I have a microphone now. Hi, everybody. Um, do you personally believe... Oh. Do you believe that... Um, do you believe that the use and existence of sex robots promote the objectification of women? Oh, simple answer, yes. Um, but uh, this is the interesting thing for me. I mean, the market for sex robots is, without a doubt, heterosexual men. There's male sex robots that exist. No one's really buying them. But... <laughs> The, <laughs> the number one request for women, I don't know if he was joking or not, this is Matt McMullen from Realbotics, who makes the, the real dolls and the real robots, sex robots, um, was that women requested, will, will he be able to take the garbage out? And it's like, <laughs> no. Also, the, uh, to be clear, I feel a bit conflicted about the sex doll situation, because they're not robots, right? So robots, when they have the technology in their head, um, and robots they'd be able to go like this. Now, if a, typically, like, a woman's not going to be able to carry this thing around the house, and there's all sorts of, like, dilemmas here. So they're not really robots, they're really mostly dolls, except for the personality type. The one thing that I have sympathy for, less the dolls, more the, the sort of AI stuff that goes in this Harmony AI's head, when I talk to the founder is, I was like, Who are bu who's buying these things? And he said, a lot of, um, a lot of people that have been through trauma um, and that have had like PTSD don't want to talk to people. And I was like, oh, in that case, 
I can kind of understand that example. But yet, yeah, is it very necessary for the robot to have huge boobs and think, no. So yeah, I agree with you. <laughs> it's not surprising. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Hi. Hello. Hello. Um, two less serious questions, maybe. First of all, you mentioned Black Mirror. Did you look the last season uh, when two guys playing on? Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. That's like kind of like body swapping. Yeah. But, yeah. Kidding, but I recommend this episode because it makes you think a lot that can you have sex with your best friend if you are straight male? Yeah. It's and what game. is sex, you yeah. know? Uh, my question is a bit different. It's more on maybe I'm not, I'm not sure it's a joke or not. We were talking about uh, objectivity, objectification of women, but on the different way, you start with an amazing toy who was designed uh, for women to play with at the beginning and uh, and to interact. This one was to interact with uh, his boyfriend. Yeah. My question was: Is it the <coughs> same? It would become the same in the opposite. Are we going to go to operation to have? a toy or real one who looks like this one because women will feel that he's better and is more adapted to their the, pleasure. The teledildonics? Yeah. Are we are going uh, to end up with this one? Why did they shoot? Ah, uh, yeah. Design? I'll show you. I'll show you. Let's yeah, go back. It looks amazing. I want one, but... Womanizer. This one is... Uh, the first one you show, the pink one. No, 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 no. The, the first one. Which one? The first one, the toy that you can play away from. Yeah, this one. This one? Yeah. So, are we going to all go to surgery to get this in the future? <sighs> Thanks for asking this question. This is an enhancement. This isn't a full replacement. So, this, this technology, Womanizer, is, it uses air suction technology for the clitoris. So, it is used with a penis or not, right? And for women, they typically have an orgasm with this under a minute. So, it's really good. Um, <laughs> but I don't think we're going to add tech. Look, actually, let me, let me share one example of someone that's biohacking their body. You can't design um, a natural suction technology. Humans don't have it. Um, but you could biohack your body. You know, these hackers that design different things and put chips inside their bodies. Augmentation. And there is one guy called Rich Lee in Utah, and he has designed the Lovetron 9000. <laughs> He's the only person that has the Lovetron 9000, but, you know, I never know. And it is a chip that he's sewn into his pelvis that vibrates. So it acts like a vibrator, so maybe people are going to do the air suction thing. You're right. Um, but Rich Lee, is no, his Lovetron 9000 is not commercially available yet, but I can see, I can see the point. Maybe people are going to design, um, you know, toys to come out of their bodies. Why not? Sure. Um, what do they call them? Cyber punks? Good question. <laughs> One over there. Oh. Over there? Two? Hi. Three. Okay. Hi. Um, thank you for the presentation. Yeah. I have actually two questions for you. You said sure. that the sex tech industry is a very huge business at the moment. Yeah. I wanted to first understand in which region or which countries do you think has the biggest market for this? And my second question is, in countries, let's say, like Thailand, where the conversation around sexuality or sex toys is mm. not as open, how would you suggest bringing about this conversation or making it more open in your experience? Okay, so the first question is, where is the sex tech industry today worldwide? And the second question is, how do we create this in Asia? Yes. <clears throat> so, most of the sex tech industry today, the entrepreneurs are concentrated in the US. Most of the interest is in Europe. The first invest fully focused VC firm on sex tech is out of Israel this, this last year. And there are, while it is a $30 billion industry, I will say a lot of that is dedicated to the toys and we will say the adjacent adult entertainment industry rather than things like assault reporting um, or education, which is a global issue that needs more attention. Um, the, there's a number of barriers towards getting started in a sex tech uh, in the industry anyway. Obviously, it's taboo, so raising money for VC firms, big, 
big problem is morality causes or working with LPs, just a lot of barriers there. People are very nervous to put money into something that says sex on it. The same goes if you're a small business or an entrepreneur that has a great idea in sex tech, you're often going to be found to be rejected from banks because of... You know, if you have sex in your name, just don't put sex in your name and open the bank account. Um, or email providers, things that typically small businesses and entrepreneurs have no trouble setting up their business. If you're starting to work in sex tech, these are the hurdles, even though it is a $30 billion industry and it's revolutionary. These are the, the hurdles that you need to sort of face up to, as well as manufacturing. Um, if, if you've got an idea and you want manufactured, some people will not work with you. So, having said all that, most, most of the innovation is coming out of the US. Most of the interest, or at least most of the talking that goes on is in Europe. It's much more open. And then a lot of the investment is um, private investment. In fact, a lot of the sex tech companies that are popular that I showed you some of today, they started out crowdfunding. It's a really great way to get started and also to get that attention, that first wave through. How do you start a sex tech industry in your city or in your country or in your continent? Um, I think a lot of it is actually starting with changing a conversation, a cultural conversation. And what I've just found personally successful is giving people permission to talk about it by talking about it normally myself. So by normalising the conversation, you then give people other people permission to do that. We ran a sex tech, well, we do run sex tech hackathons with the company Future of Sex that I run, um, and we ran one in Singapore. And what I found was really interesting about running one in Singapore versus running one in Sydney or running one in New York is actually getting people to the event was really tough. But uh, once the doors were closed, people had the most amazing ideas. They flew in from Japan, they flew in from China, but it was almost like we had to use a whisper network, um, a lot of WhatsApp rather than Facebook advertising or any advertising we'd use in Sydney to actually drive people to the event. So, yeah, I think there's a, uh, there is this, this cultural barrier that I'm not familiar with, because um, I'm not from here, that I think that it goes away to to, to start to open those communities by having those events, by having those spaces where people can talk normally. And I would point to the, sorry, the growth of the, this women of sex tech community was just, it's been explosive. Like from 30 people to over 250 in the space of three to four years is kind of incredible. So once you provide those safe spaces, people do come and yeah, maybe you have to get creative in the ways that you spread the word about those spaces first. And you can also contact me and I'll run a sex tech hackathon in Bangkok. <laughs> cool. How are we going for time? Should I go? Should I go? Am I allowed to go? No? Okay. Hello? One of the biggest challenges because of uh, technology has been the growing disconnect between human beings. Um, do you think things like sex tech is going to increase that that ch chasm between humans more? That's my first question. And my second question is, uh, globally, there are so many global concerns, plagues us from civil war to so many other issues. Yeah. Every country, every nation. Why should somebody invest in something like this? Yeah. Okay, so the first question, um, sorry, was... Uh, will sex tech separate us or bring us together? We already have this problem with disconnection. And the second question was, why invest in sex tech? So, the first question, um, will sex tech bring us together or will it slide us further apart? I think, for me, really depends on where we're looking, right? So, I shared examples where most certainly, like, Gatebox feels like that's going to drive people apart. People are marrying Gatebox. They're certainly not practicing intimacy skills with another other than uh, AI. And then, you know, I'm an optimist and where I want to redirect the attention and put the spotlight on is those technologies that actually help us connect, help us be more human. And so with that, that connection to body, first of all, with OMGS, I think is a really great example of something where connecting to body and connecting to your partner and having conversations you probably wouldn't otherwise have or wouldn't know how to have. So I think there is certainly, like, that's a very fence-sitting uh, statement, but I think it's true. You know, it depends. This industry is so huge. It really depends on where we're focused and where we're shining the light. It's the same question of 
dating apps? Do they bring us together or do they drive us further apart? There's arguments for and against. Um, so that's, that's my, I'd be interested on your thoughts on that. And then why invest in sex tech? I mean, my personal reason is this is core to who we are as human beings and to your first part of like why, why it's so important for us to connect with who we are. Our sexuality is our identity. It's how we move through the world. And I think there's certainly aspects of that that are really compelling in technology. But the reason why people invest in sex tech is because they think that they're going to see a return on the money. And certainly... That's true of um, the adult industry, and I would say to some extent the toy industry, menopause, um, and all this rush of pharmaceuticals around Viagra and, and that. Um, but that's the reason people invest. I'm sorry, I forgot the, the other end. Why is sex more important than death, you know? For some people it is, or food, or famine. Yeah, great questions. Thank you. Should I go? Okay. Two, two more? Yeah. Hi. You touched Hi. upon this. Hi. I'm here. Sorry. You touched upon this in your introduction about like gender identity and kind of the benefits. I was wondering if you had any experiences of sex tech which is inclusive of like the LGBTI community or just going beyond the binary. Do you have any personal experience? Uh, I just think with the, uh, the most I interesting stuff in that realm is probably the toys that are being developed and being developed by people that are non-binary you know and I think that's the most important thing about this industry there's a lot of chat about it being inclusive or diverse but it's really like well how are we democratizing the industry and inviting people in that probably don't have the capital or the expertise in technology but they definitely have an identity and a need same goes with um, people with physical disabilities and how they're designing sex tech for themselves I would also say like the aging population any sort of minority group Group. Um, there are examples, but they're yeah. like e everything. One more question. Hi. Uh, sorry. Hi. Hello. Uh, my question is more about data kind of protection. So we know that technology is not always uh, trustful, and all the technology is showing very intimate details on when you're going home, actually how you like having your sex. Is there extra care in sex tech to protect this data? Is no. there any risk? No, there's massive risk. Um, and especially you, you, you'll find with vibrators and stuff that, um, you know, there was this movement a couple of years ago around quantified sex apps where people were really obsessed, mostly guys, with, like, measuring their stroke count and, like, putting these things on, like Fitbits for dicks. Um, anyway, they didn't take off because of this um, <laughs> privacy issue, but what actually happened is some vibrators that, you know, the vibrators, the teledildonics that come with the apps that track your orgasms, they do really amazing, like, data viz, and you can see, you can make, you know, your orgasms into songs, you know, with the visualizations and arts, really cool. Um, Google it, there's some amazing visuals there. But yeah, I can Google it and find someone's arty orgasm, like, you know, there's, so there was a data breach in that case, and I will still say it is the Wild West out there with most of sex tech, um, and definitely a concern to be aware of. All right, well, thank you for having me. Thank you for asking hard questions. Gets you thinking. Appreciate it. <laughs>